tenemos el honor de tener con nosotros al doctor Christian Hoffman. Eh, él comenzó su trabajo en personas con VIH desde 1995 como investigador en la Clínica Ambulatoria de Enfermedades Infecciosas de la Universidad de Eppendorf en Hamburgo. También trabajó en la Universidad de Kiel en el Curatorium de Inmunodeficiencia de Múnich y en el Hospital San George en Hamburgo. Ha sido editor del HIV Medicine desde el 2003 y presidente del Munich AIDS Days desde el 2002 y de la Conferencia Alemana Austriaca sobre SIDA en el 2021. También ha sido elegido presidente del German Clinical AIDS Working Group del 2007 al 2010 y ha participado en numerosas conferencias clínicas y ensayos sobre VIH. El doctor Christian Kaufmann ha publicado más de 200 artículos, resúmenes y capítulos de libros. Sus intereses en la investigación abarcan las neoplasias malignas relacionadas con VIH, las infecciones oportunistas y los nuevos antirretrovirales. Desde el 2007 trabaja en el Centro de Estudios Infection Medical Center de Hamburgo, el ICH, el cual es uno de los tres centros de VIH más grandes de Alemania. El centro ICH participa en todos los ensayos clínicos sobre eh, pacientes con resistencia a fármacos, incluidos los estudios de Lenacapavir, Islatravir, Ivalizumab y Fostensavir. Es un placer para nosotros que esté esta tarde. So can you see my slides? Yes, doctor. You, you do, okay. So <clears throat> thank you. And a good evening from Hamburg in Germany. First of all, before I start, I would like to say three things. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here tonight and to share some slides on multidrug resistance with you. And secondly, I must apologize that my voice is a bit rough, but I received my first positive Corona PCR on Monday. And still I hope I can get through the next 45 minutes without brain fog and that I can focus to some extent and that I won't make too many mistakes. My CT value is 23, and you can be glad that this is not a face-to-face -face event today. <laughs> and thirdly, I would, I would like to share with you my financial disclosures, and these are my disclaimers. And yes, I am in contact with several companies um, engaged in the HIV multidrug resistance setting. I've been Mexico, to Mexico once so far at the World AIDS Conference in 2008. And yes, we are far apart. And in fact, I am sitting at my desk at home in quarantine in Hamburg right now. And usually when not in quarantine, I work at the ICH Study Center where we care for about 3,500 patients with a total of eight HIV specialists. Our facility is located right in the center of Hamburg, a beautiful port city in the northern Germany. In the following minutes, I will focus on three aspects. First, definitions in epidemiology, and then I would like to talk about clinical management and present a few interesting cases from which one can learn a lot, I think. And finally, I will talk about new options that could be considered for patients with multidrug resistance. First of all, it is important to note that there's no proper definition of multidrug resistance and everyone understands it differently. For example, heavily treatment experienced is different from multi-class resistance and limited options or very limited options is different from multi-class failure. But it is, it is very important to distinguish between these terms, as we will see in a moment. 
Unfortunately, guidelines often don't really help. And if you look at the sections on multidrug resistance, a lot of it is very vague and general. For example, you know, the DHHS guidelines, consensus is lacking, uh, consulta uh, consultation with an expert may be needed, discuss on case by case, further research is needed. So guidelines do not help in these patients and they cannot help. And things become even more complicated as many factors beyond resistance may limit treatment options in these patients. Co-medications, we have to consider potential drug-drug interactions, comorbidities such as hepatitis or renal diseases, cardiovascular diseases. The current situation is important. Um, is the patient experiencing virological failure or is he virologically suppressed? What about his immune status? Are there intolerabilities? Um, and what about his adherence, uh, social factors and preferences? So talking about epidemiology, epidemiology um, it's clear that triple class resistance is on, the on a decline. This is data from a systematic review, uh, including 34 studies from the US and Canada, showing a clear decline over the years of triple class resistance. And the same is true in Europe. This is data from a huge cohort in Europe, Europe um, including almost 40,000 patients in SUC, especially the number for four class resistance is from is constantly low. And um, this is data from Switzerland. Why Switzerland? Switzerland has the by far best documented cohort, I think, in the world. And um, this cohort includes almost 11,000 patients. And um, you see here that the vast majority of patients with triple class resistance is in blue. So these patients have started their antiretroviral therapy before 2000. So these are the old patients with triple class resistance. And the number of four class resistance in this well documented cohort is very, very small. Only 14 patients were found in this Swiss cohort, which includes 11,000 patients. In 2017, several colleagues and I have started the lower study, which is a prospective study, a cohort study of viremic and avaremic patients um, with at least triple class resistance to NRTIs, NNRTIs, PIs, or integrase inhibitors. And we've done this in order to learn more about the clinical situation and the resistance patterns um, in this difficult to treat group. And these are the characteristics of the patients. We have included 243 patients, among them 220 with triple class resistance and uh, 23 with four class resistance. You see the patients are relatively old, 55 years, many of them with non-R5 tropism, uh, and a good current CD4 cells of about 500, 600, um, despite a very low CD4 nadir of less than 100. Many of them have suffered AIDS-defining illnesses. The patients are more than 20 years on, um, on antiretroviral therapy, and many of them have started with mono or dual NRTI um, regimens. So the vast majority has started ART before 2000, as seen in Switzerland. And what was somewhat surprising to us was the fact that the majority of the patients were virologically suppressed. And this was also seen in patients with four-class resistance, where almost two-thirds of the patients um, had an undetectable viremia. So if we talk about heavily treatment experienced patients, um, 
the numbers of triple class failure, triple class resistance is much lower. If you look at the data from Switzerland, you will have 2,000 or 3,000 patients who are heavily treat, treat, uh, treatment experienced, but will, you will only have a few patients with triple class resistance and very few patients with more than three classes affected. And the number of patients running out of options is very low. And this was also seen in our lower study where we included 246 or 43 patients with triple class resistance. And we found only six, uh, six eight patients um, to be viremic and six patients running out of options. And the lower study represents about 25% of all patients in care in Germany. So let's talk about clinical management. And I think it's important to, to consider the experience in patients with moderate resistance. And I think we can a lot from these studies as, as the numbers are relatively um, big in, in, in these studies. This is a, a pooled analysis of six randomized trials, including more than 2,000 patients. And the patients were switched to Big Tarvi, um, so Big Tigra via FTAF. And um, the authors uh, looked at patients with a baseline M184V uh, mutations, uh, mutation plus other uh, resistance associated mutations in proviral DNA. And as you see here, all patients who had developed um, these mutations, M -O, uh, M184V plus the K65R or plus PI mutations or INSTI mutations remained undetectable um, with Bictari. So at least in the case of moderate resistance, I think one can consider even an STR, including um, big tigravir in these patients. And this is data from the 1844 study, switching patients from dolotigravir, abacavir, um, to big tarvi. And again, uh, the baseline resistance in proviral DNA. And if you look here, 16 patients with integrase resistance mutations remained undetectable while on Bictarvi. And, and again, this, this shows us that at least in some patients, we can consider single tablet regimens in patients with multi-class resistance. So how far can we go? And this is data from Italy uh, saying not too far, please. This is data from Italy showing, analyzing patients um, who were switched to a dual therapy, dolotigravir and 3TC, uh, more than 600 patients, incredible high numbers. And as you see, um, the presence of the MO84V uh, plus TAMS was a risk factor for virological failure. So monotherapy with dolotrigravir may not be enough. And this is another study analyzing patients with moderate resistance. And I think this is the most important study uh, presented at this year's CROI meeting, a, a study from Africa, um, including patients with NNRTI failure in a two to two design and the patients were randomized after failing uh, their regimen and having a viral load of above thousand copies. Uh, they were randomized to the dolotegravir or darunavir and they were also randomized to switch their background, uh, their backbone, their new backbone to zidovidine or to remain on tenofovir. And TDF, all the way switched to Darunavir and again um, switching or not uh, the nuke backbone. 
And although the patients had only failure to an NNR, uh, NNRTI regimen, you see here this study that has included 464 patients from seven African sites, um, the baseline resistance in the nuke class was, was really high with 60% TDF resistance and 3TC 92% resist, uh, resistance. And the first lesson from this study was that switch the backbone to zidovidine was not better, even worse. And it, it, was, uh, it didn't play a role whether the K65R or the MO84V was present or absent. So in almost all cases, it was better to, to remain on TDF and not to switch on uh, to zidovidine. And even in the patients, uh, who had a K65R at baseline, which is um, the main, the key mutation uh, for uh, TDF. Um, Zidovidine was not better. So this study shows us that, that I think it's, it's worth to, to reconsider switching the backbone in these patients failing in an NNRTI regimen. And the second lesson was that dolutegravir and darunavir performed both, uh, were both effective. And, but the third lesson was for me that the resistance with um, dolutegravir, um, resistance mutations um, with dolutegravir uh, were more frequent compared to darunavir. And there were seven patients, about 3% of the patients who develop virological failure um, with resistance against dolutegravir compared to zero patients um, developing resistance against darunavir. So maybe this may indicate that the resistance barrier for darunavir is even higher compared to dolutegravir. So what about the clinical management uh, of multidrug resistance. And I will discuss with you some, some questions. Uh, the persistence of resistance, is it really lifelong? When is it feasible to de-escalate a regimen? Can proviral DNA help in decision-making? And how many active drugs do we need? So now we'll start with the patient. Um, this man, um, had started his antiretroviral therapy in 1995 with old drugs with ACT, DDC, sequinavir, old PIs, D4T, etc. And then he was switched on a yeah on a on a toxic combination D4T, DDI, and nivirapine. And this was later changed to the uh, to TDF, FTC, and nivirapine. And I can tell you, we were really shocked when his viral load rebounded in 2009. And we, we were really shocked about his resistance um, testing, showing that all NRTIs, but also nivirapine, efavirenz, and two protease inhibitors were resistant. And the question I had is, why did this... Why did these regimens work? Because none of these um, agents were active. And I can tell you in the lower study, where we have included uh, 195 patients, we found seven patients with a viral load below 50, despite a GSS of less than one active drug. And you see the details of the patients here on this table. And we found three patients who had no single active drug in their regimen, but they, were, uh, they remained virologically suppressed. Two patients, inter interestingly, on PI monotherapy. But years of viral suppression, you see here nine years 
during lopinavir monotherapy um, despite a fully resistant virus. So in my eyes, in some cases, um, uh, not all resistance mutations are preserved lifelong in a patient. So what happened with our patients? So I tell you, we were shocked about these resistance patterns and we switched him to a very um, intensive treatment, Daruna via BID, Raltegra via Maraviroc and Itravirine, and the patient uh, became resuppressed. However, he complained about this 10 pills a day regimen and we performed a resistance testing from proviral DNA and 10 years later, and we found only wild type, no, not a single resistance in, in his proviral DNA. So the question is whether we can rely on this. And for this question, we've done um, an analysis in the lower study where we performed next generation sequencing proviral DNA from PBMCs using two cutoffs. And we compared the resistance mutations um, uh, in the proviral DNA with cumulative RAMs from previous historical genotyping resistance testings in plasma. And this was done after ApoBec filtering, et cetera. And this, uh, these results we've presented at, at this year's CROI meeting, and we selected um, um, a group of patients in stable conditions. So we, we did this because we wanted to have patients where we didn't expect any changes in the proviral resistance archive. And the patients were more than five years um, completely virologically suppressed, had no blips, no interruptions, and two thirds of them had didn't have any therapy changes during the last years. And on the first glance, we, we had very impressive results. So we found 76% of the historically known RAMs, including an addition, 19% um, of newly previously unknown RAMs. And this was done by a cutoff of 1% and using a cutoff of 15%, the numbers were slightly lower, 63% um, percent of historical RAMs and 7% new RAMs. So our NGS was very sensitive. However, we found a high discordance between 2017, the first study, and 2020, the second study. So the value of proviral DNA resistance testing is very limited in my eyes. And among 96 patients with multidrug resistance HIV and sustained virological suppression, two uh, genotypes from BBMC yielded high detection uh, rates of historical RAMs. However, there was a considerable temporal vari variability in about one third of the historical RAMs were found only once. We had 50% of the patients who had higher detection rates in 2017 compared to 2020, indicating somewhat waning of resistance. But 26% had higher detection rate, rates at the second measurement. And the mutational patterns change, changes appeared non-directional and unaffected by antiretroviral therapy. So I think these results argue against treatment decisions and de-escalation strategies based on proviral genotyping alone. So another patient, uh, this patient um, became positive in 1992, and he's since 25 years on antiretrovirals. Um, um, of note, he was on a double PI strategy, which was on vogue in Germany in um, 20 years ago, on lopinavir, sacrinavir, 
And he was undetectable, his viral load was undetectable when I saw him first in 2017. And I switched him uh, to the Do Dolotegravir and Darunavir. However, the patient had some problems with CNS and um, GI. So I had to switch him um, on uh, Symptusa and then due to GI issues um, to Bictavi in 2019. And then we performed in 2019 a resistance test against all NRTIs, NNR, uh, and we found resistance against all NRTIs, NNRTIs, and PIs. So there were no instirams. The patient remained undetectable, but the only active drug, according to his historical resistance testing, is Bictegravir. And the question is, um, and I don't have yet an answer, whether it makes sense to intensify his treatment, for example, to add on Fostemsavir, which has been uh, approved uh, one year ago in Germany. So how many active drugs do we need in multidrug resistance patients? And if you look at the guidelines, uh, they, they mostly say at least two and preferably three. And they also mention that this should include a, a drug with a high resistance barrier. So according to these guidelines, one active drug is not enough. But this is somewhat surprising. If you look at, for example, the Fostensary data from the Brighty study, the Brighty study is a large study, large phase three study on Fostensavir. And as shown here, um, the number of the active drugs in the optimized background therapy, there are almost no differences between patients um, with uh, one, active uh, one active drug or more than one to two or more than two active drugs, whether you look with genotyping or phenotyping sensitivity score you, you find no difference. So this drug seems to be very ro robust. And I think it's time to reconsider the dogma that you have, uh, that you have to um, give the patient three active drugs. So some practical issues in multidrug resistance settings. I think it's important to make it is simple as possible, even in these patients. These patients, they have their adherence issues and QD is no doubt better than BID. And I would be creative with FDC uh, with uh, fixed dose combinations and single tablet regimens. And these, these drugs are preferred. We have to avoid toxic or old drugs such as AZT, Tipranavir, DDI, uh, we should prefer drugs with high resistance barrier. Uh, so the second integrase inhib inhibitors, donotegravir and bictegravir, are better than avitegravir and raltegravir. And darunavir is better than the old PIs. And etravirine and uh, doravirine should be preferred over nivirapine and nefavirenz. And I think we should not rely on resistance testings and proviral DNA. We have to be very careful. I think no monotherapy if possible, but I think there's no evidence for three versus two active drugs. In some patients, even one uh, active drug will work. We have to consider comorbidities, comedication, interoperabilities, etc. One question is whether the um, 3TC in the presence of the M. 184V uh, may have some protective effects. What are the guidelines telling us? This mutation is very frequent on patients failing on 3TC or FTC, and it has indeed a negative impact on the replication capacity. However, um, the American guidelines say they data are insufficient. The Europeans say Yo, it might be beneficial the, uh, the um, World Health Organization says it may not be optimal. And I can tell you the, the German guidelines, they say, can make sense. 
So one slide I was asked to 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 mention Moravi rock. Um, I think uh, this rock is um, hampered by the high number of X4 virus in this difficult to treat patient population. If you look at patients with a low CD4 nadir of less than uh, 50, you will have a huge number of patients with X4 virus. And we also looked at the, at the lower study for the tropism and proviral DNA, and we found that less than half of the patients had R5 at both time points, and of note, 15% of these patients showed surprisingly a, a prism switch. So I think we always have to consider Maraviroc, but in many cases uh, of multi-drug resistance, it will not work. So coming to strategies facing different patterns of resistance, and I told you the guidelines are relatively vague and in general, so I tried my best to uh, make these slides for younger colleagues, and I tried to, to include my own experience. And <clears throat> if we look at a patient uh, where the NNRTI and the NRTI is, are lost, uh, but uh, PIs and integrase are fully uh, susceptible, I think it makes sense to use either the Symptusa or Bictarvi. Uh, you may consider another active regimen. In the case of moderate resistance to PIs or moderate resistance to integrase, I think you can use a very powerful combination which was used in the lower study in uh, more than 60 patients, Simtuza and Dolutegravir. So the Darunavir fixed dose combination and Dolutegravir is very, very powerful and the resistance barrier is very high. You may consider Dolutegravir or Darunavir double dosing. However, this means that this is no longer a QD regimen, it's a, it's a BID regimen. So, and if both groups, PIs and integrase, are affected, then you could consider Simtuza and Dolutegravir plus Fostemsavir or Maraviroc. Again, you may consider do uh, double dosing. And the individualized um, area begins when uh, all four classes are partially or fully affected. And then you can consider Fostemsavir and Ibalisumab and lenacapavir and other drugs, other experimental drugs. Just one thing, if the NNRTIs are only partially affected, you can be very creative. And I can tell you, we have many colleagues at our center, they are really creative. I've seen regimens um, such as Dolotegarvir and Delstrigo, uh, which is a fixed dose combination with doravirine or the DD combo, dolotegravir and doravirine, uh, but also bictegravir and uh, doravirine. Um, and I've even one patient, uh, two patients, uh, where the physician, the treating physician, found a moderate integrase resistance but almost no, only one mutations in the NNRTI gene. And, and these patients, they received uh, Dovato and Yuluka, which are two FDCs in the morning, Dovato, and in the evening, Yuluka, which was really interesting. This was really a creative combo in the case of only moderate resistance to NNRTIs. But again, then uh, the individualized area starts here, and then you can also include itravirine and doravirine in the regimen. So this is the exper experimental area. This is the area of the new drugs. And uh, I want to finish with some, some slides on new options. Uh, we have now four, uh, four new options, two of them already approved in Europe. It's the Fostemsavir and the ibalisumab, and then we have two compounds, two promising compounds in clinical trials, lenacapavir, the capsid inhibitor, and islatravir, 
the transfiltration inhibitor. And I want to briefly go through this. Um, Fostemsavir first, Fostemsavir binds to GP120. It's a very interesting drug. And I, I've showed you all, uh, already a slide from the Brighty study, this phase three study, where Fostemsavir was um, tested in heavily treatment experienced patients. And um, there were 371 patients in 168 centers. And there were two cohorts. Um, one, uh, the one cohort which uh, underwent a randomization for, 10, uh, for eight days had one to two active antiretrovirals and the non-randomized cohort had no active antiretroviral uh, in, in their optimized background therapy. And despite huge exhaustion at baseline of almost all classes, um, here in the non-randomized cohort, almost all drugs were exhausted. And uh, even in the randomized cohort, the only active uh, class was uh, the integrase inhibitors. And despite these extensive resistance, um, the success was remarkable. And we had 62% of the randomized cohort below 40 copies at one year. And even in the non-randomized cohort, almost 50% achieved a viral suppression. And this indicates to me that Fostemsavir is really a robust um, agent. And this is also indicated, I showed you this, by the active drugs in the optimized background therapy. I think this is really a, a very robust um, drug. However, um, even though the virological suppression did not depend on active drugs, it depends on baseline viral load. So if you have a low viral load while failing a regimen, you will achieve um, in 71% um, a virus suppression. If the viral load is high, of higher than 100,000, it's only 35%. And the same is true with CD4 cells. CD4 above 200, 68% virological suppression. Uh, CD4 lower than 20, 35%. So what about safety of Fostemsavir? Fostemsavir is a very safe drug with very low numbers of adverse events occurring in the Brighty study in our experience, it's very well tolerated. There's some issues with the BID dosing, which is necessary in some drug-drug interactions, but it's really a, a very safe drug, which uh, will be used more frequently, I think, during the next month in our country. So what about Ivalisumab, just a few words. Ivalisumab is not binding to GP120. It's binding to the CD4 receptor, the second domain. And um, uh, we've seen the uh, one small study on 40 patients with at, at least triple class resistance and more than 2,000, uh, more than 1,000 um, HIV RNA, uh, RNA copies. And this new drug received approval in 2019 as Trogazzo is given every two weeks. And as you see here, um, the, the, the proportion of patients achieving a viral suppression was about 40%, but this number was far lower in those patient, patients most in need in patients with low CD4 counts of less than 50. And the percentage was less than 20%. However, the drug was approved. And uh, we've done this in a few patients. So the experience is still limited. And we don't, we don't know enough about long-term safety. And one important issue is the pricing. The costs are more than 100,000 euros a year. And um, in Germany, we had uh, by far less than 50, uh, 50 patients. 
And unfortunately, there was no agreement on the pricing between the company Terra Technologies and uh, the German health authorities. So unfortunately, this drug was withdrawn from the German market in February this year. A few words to uh, about Linacapavir, the capsid inhibitor with, uh, that has shown high efficacy in multidrug resistant uh, virus. Uh, it is developed as a long acting regimen given subcutaneously every th six months. And this is some data from the Capella study um, published at this year's CROI meeting. A small study, only 36 patients, but some of them with no fully active agent in their background and four out of six um, patients um, achieved an undetectable viral load. So very powerful, and very promising drug with a new uh, mechanisms or a mechanism of action. But um, I think one one question we have when when we realize the calibrate uh, study results, and this is a study from treatment naive patients. The question is how high is the resistance barrier uh, of lenacapavir? Because in this study on treatment naive patients, we have had up to now two cases of lenacapavir resistance, which is quite unusual in um, in treatment naive patients. Uh, both cases had a poor adherence to their background therapy. However, two, um, one to two percent in treatment naive, it may indicate uh, that the drug is not so powerful as expected. And there are some production issues and um, there are some uh, problems with the drug solution, with the wild quality. I can tell you the patients who participated in, in the trials, they had uh, moderate pain at the injection site. So there's some problems and Gilead is working on this and hopefully they will come back. All, all, all um, studies uh, were placed on hold um, and the patients now taking orally lenacapavir once a week. And we're waiting um, for the subcutaneous uh, new drug solution. The Islatravir has, um, has seen a CD4 decline and lymphopenia in some patients. And I think this will be the end of a very promising drug. And many of you may know that the FDA has stopped all Islatravir oral and implant trials in December last year. And to be honest, I can't imagine that, that uh, the FDA will ever give green light again um, for this drug. However, we will see. Hopefully, I'm wrong because Islatravir was a very promising drug with a new uh, mechanism of action was very powerful uh, with Dor Doravarine, uh, the combination, but okay, we will see. So MDR and new drugs, um, there's a high medical need and very low numbers of patients. They're difficult to design and to conduct studies. Uh, the uh, resistance patterns are very heterogeneous low numbers of patients. Remember in the Brighty study, uh, they had to recruit 168 centers for 300 patients, incredible work. There are some ethical issues with the monotherapy and even with patients failing a regimen. Will we wait one month um, to include a patient in a clinical trial? And many new options have seen set setbacks during recent months. Ivalisumab, the pricing issues, Lena Kapavir, the production is lateral CD4 decline, and the monoclonal antibodies have faced several resistance issues as shown at the CROI this year. And my question is, and I hopefully not 
that the, 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 the companies will lose interest. And I will, um, I will end my talk with a patient who uh, um, had a tremendous success with the new drugs. And this is a perinatally infected patient, a young man, um, now 30 years old. And you see here his resistance patterns and his virus is um, resistance resistant to every uh, every drug um, tested and um, um, if you look at for example as his uh, integrase uh, resistance associate mutations over time all the three pathways um, or the main pathways for integrase resistance are affected not at the same time but the patient has developed Virtually all, actually all resistance mutations um, known for integrase resistance. So and these are his viral load and CD4 counts over time. And here in 2014, um, I put him on a, a combination with Truvada, ACT, and double dosing Darunavir and um, the, the success was only short term here. He had a viral load of less than 100, but then he rebounded. And then I put him on a very intensive regimen where I took almost all drugs I had, including valacyclovir and um, also PEC interferon, dolotigravir, uh, fourfold not double dose, fourfold dosing, and the viral load remained only uh, for short term at low ranges, but then increase. And as you see, the CD4 cells were decreasing over time. Here in 2018, he was below 200, and the patient um, had developed several serious clinical events, um, a herpes, a severe herpes infection, a TTP with a severe anemia, a pancreatitis, and a bacterial pneumonia. And it's so important to, to achieve a virological suppression in these patients. And this is data from the prestigio cohort from Italy and showing that the probability of AIDS or death is really higher when you don't achieve a virological suppression um, in these patients. And I can tell you I was a little bit um, desperate in, 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 this, in this young man because his virus was so resistant. resistant. And um, then uh, I put him on uh, the new drugs, lenacapavir, fostemsavir, and ivalisumab. And you see his viral load is less than 50 copies now for, for the first time in his life. And uh, this is really encouraging. And hopefully, Lena Kappenvir will overcome the production issues and will come on the market. So and this was my final slide. Thank you for your attention. And yeah, so if you have any question, I'm here, despite Corona. Hola, doctor. Buena tarde. Soy María Berrospe. Soy parte del equipo de Sidvi. Y antes que nada, eh, a nombre del, de Sidvi, yo quiero agradecerle el que nos haya dado este espacio para hablar de su experiencia y sobre todo reconocerle que a pesar de, de estar ahorita convaleciente de, de esta reciente infección por COVID esté aquí con nosotros y felicitarlo por esta presentación eh, nos dio muchos puntos eh, muy interesantes realmente toda la plática fue muy muy interesante y, y bueno a mí me surgen de inicio algunas dudas este por, mencionó un punto eh, donde los estudios que ustedes realizaron en el estudio Lauer, por ejemplo, mencionó que no observaron que no todas las mutaciones de resistencia se mantienen durante toda la vida. Este, 
Entonces, esto se debe a que el, eh, no está presionado, o sea, no aparecen las mutaciones porque no está presionado el virus con estos fármacos o porque realmente llega el momento en que esta mutación ya no se expresa y podríamos tener la seguridad de utilizar un antirretroviral que este, de la misma familia de la que ya ha fallado, pudiéramos rescatar a este paciente multiexperimentado este, pensando pues de que ya no está presente esa mutación. Y la, la otra pregunta también es, de acuerdo a lo que comentó, es mencionó también que hay algunos pacientes que no tenían falla virológica evidente porque tenían supresión, o sea, no estaba la, ni tenían carga viral detectable ni tampoco hacían blips, pero en el DNA proviral ustedes observaron que había mutaciones de resistencia. ¿Esto por qué se debe? Esa pregunta. It's a very good question. And I, I must confess that I don't know the answer. So this is a rare event. Patients with uh, a, a, a regimen that cannot work uh, with regard to the historical resistance mutations. We found seven patients. You know, we, we, we hypothes hypothesized that, you know, the, the virus, the resistance may not be on the same clones. However, there were two patients with the monotherapy, a PI monotherapy, that worked and my own my only explanation for this is that that not all resistance mutations will be preserved lifelong but you cannot rely on this so and and the main the main lesson from the lower study is that you cannot rely on proviral dna testing so if you don't find a resistance in the proviral dna um this the, this does not mean anything and but keep in mind that the patients without any active drugs um, these were patients where even the historical genotype resistance testing from plasma and not proviral dna resistance testing historical resistance testing from plasma said that um, there was no active drug So, but but I don't know the answer for this. But I think this is an interesting research field for the next uh, for the next years. Gracias, doctor. Gracias por su ponencia muy clara. Eh, la pregunta que nos hace el auditorio es: eh, en pacientes en segunda falla o más. ¿Dos fármacos activos serían suficientes para suprimirlo? Por ejemplo, Dalunavir, Covisistaf, más Dolutegravir. That's a good question. Um, I think two, two drugs in, 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 in most patients will be enough. And I was really surprised seeing the data from the Fostemsovir study but did not play any role how many active drugs were in the optimized background. And if you look at other, other drugs, um, I think there's no evidence to include three active drugs. Um, I, I'm not aware about of any study showing that three active drugs um, were better than two. So I think in most cases, it makes sense to combine two active drugs, but you have to consider the resistance barrier. The higher, the better, and you need drugs with high resistance barrier. So dolotegravir and darunavir, and these are my preferred drugs in, in these patients. Bien. Eh, tenemos otra pregunta de del auditorio del doctor Gesser Lezama, eh, menciona que entendió que los niveles más bajos de CD4 podrían estar relacionados con MK8507, que en combinación con Islatravir desarrolló este resultado. ¿Hay alguna posibilidad de que Islatravir cause una caída en los CD4? Yeah, we observed um, a lymphopenia 
um, associated with the CD4 decline. Uh, I think we, we have included 15 patients in the Islatravia trial, and there, was, there were two patients who had a transient lymphopenia. And this uh, goes in line with the CD4 decline. This was reversible, but I think this will be a big problem. And I don't, I don't believe that the FDA will give green light um, again. Because these are our surrogate markers and, but hopefully I'm wrong. Sabemos que Maraviroc es un fármaco útil en pacientes eh, con resistencia a otras clases de antirretrovirales. Sin embargo, eh, frecuentemente vemos que ya no tienen tropismo CSR5 cuando deseamos utilizarlo. ¿De qué depende el cambio de este tropismo de CSR5 a CXR4? ¿Del tiempo de infección, de la disminución de los CD4, eh, de la clave del virus? And we didn't find any evidence for any factor um, predicting a tropism switch. We know that low CD4 cells um, is predictive for X, X4. And I fully agree, Maraviroc is a fantastic drug. Uh, it's very well tolerated. And one question, and we don't have yet an answer for this, is whether we should use Maraviroc even in those patients with X4, just to keep the virus, you know, to apply some pressure on the virus. And um, in some cases I've done this, um, as shown in my, you know, in my desperate cases at the end of my talk, um, when in 2018, I gave him almost everything I had, I also included Maraviroc because is such a well-tolerated drug. Um, however, most of the patients have a low CD4 cell uh, nadir, and this predicts um, non-R5 tropism. No te escuchamos. Si pueden ascender al doctor Antonio Mata que quiera hacer una pregunta al doctor Hoffman. Y en lo que lo ascienden, hay una pregunta en el panel. Eh, lo felicitan por su presentación en el tema tan prometedor y nuevo para todos nosotros. Y la pregunta es si ha tenido evidencia o experiencia con el tipo de terapia Fonsten Fostensambir, Lenacapavir y Valucimab como monoterapia o debe combinarse con otro tipo de antiretroviral en pacientes con resistencia a los medicamentos. I think, I think these drugs should be combined with at least one other drug, one other active drug. And I, I would question whether it ne it's necessary to, to, to combine three active drugs, but two active drugs, I think, in these patients with extensive resistance, where you consider fostanzavir or linacapavir, or where you consider the two weekly infusions with ibalizumab, I think you have to make sure that you have at least one other active um, agent. And if you don't have an active agent, uh, uh, an active agent, I think you should combine them um, too. So fostanzavir plus linacapavir or plus ibalizumab. I, I, I don't know whether ibalizumab is available in your country. As I said, in our country, it has been withdrawn from the market. Um, but I, I think... Um, the 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 potency no, no, no potency of these drugs is not um, um, has an end and um, 
I think it's better to combine them. Hi, Dr. Christian. Thank Hi. you so much for your for your talk. Uh, instead of you are uh, with coronavirus, you are here with us, and uh, we appreciate so much that. Uh, I have um, one short question and one comment. Um, the, the the question is about Faustin Sabir. Um, uh, what what you know about the the. A genetic barrier of Faustin Sabir. Do, do you think it's a high genetic barrier and we can uh, almost uh, add another uh, drug that is active to combine and this is a good uh, option for uh, to rescue some, some uh, patients with uh, resistance? I Yes, I think so. I think I think the resistance barrier is pretty high. And this has been shown in the variety study um, where I showed you know the number of active drugs. And despite in the non-randomized cohort, there were 100 patients and 50% of them achieved a viral load below the limit of detection for 48 weeks although they had only fostanzavir as the only active drug. And this indicates that this drug is robust. But, I mean, cl clinical reality will show, but I would expect the resistance barrier to be high. Okay, thank you. Higher than I expected. Okay, okay. It, it, it is very, very interesting because... Uh... A uh, high uh, genetic very drugs is what we need right now. Yes, uh, at least for for patients with uh, high high resistant uh, problems. And uh, the, my, my comment is uh, your, your last case that you present that uh, uh, you rescue with ivalizumab, fostensavir, and lenacapavir is not an option in Mexico. Uh, we we don't have ivalizumab if is uh, so expensive for Germany for all. For us, it's, it's almost impossible. We don't have Ivalizumab in Mexico. Fosten Sabir, uh, we don't have yet in Mexico. I hope that maybe in next uh, months, uh, we could have some, some good news. And Lena Capavir uh, is maybe in, in, in clinical trial, but uh, still approved for Emma? No, Lena Capavir is still experimental and the patient participates in a clinical trial, and I can tell you we have stopped the ivalizumab, but the patient is still undetectable on a two-drug regimen consisting lenacapavir and fostanzavir. So we had to stop the ivalizumab. Uh, and now that with, with, with your last case that presented um, with uh, ivalizumab, right now you said that you, you, you won't have more Ivalizumab in Germany. No. Now, what 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 will, what will happen with that patient that that you have with the yeah, we had to, we Lenacapavir. had to we had to stop the Ivalizumab and we continued the um, Lenacapavir and the um, the Fostemzavir and the patient is now for yeah the last viral load was still undetectable. But I mean, this is a serious problem. However, he has two active drugs now, and <clears throat> hopefully, this, um, this this will be enough. Yes, because it returns to my first uh, question. Maybe fostensavir and lenacapavir is enough for 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 this patient. We'll see. <laughs> You, you, you can't uh, later, you will tell about that, that patient, what happened with... Yeah, the maybe drugs. next year, <laughs> maybe next year. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, it's, it's not a good option right now, Corona beer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Christian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eh, sabemos que los genotipos eh, son fundamentales en un paciente que ha fallado a múltiples esquemas de tratamiento. 
eh, pedíamos genotipo o fenotipo. Mi pregunta es si en este momento actual tendría alguna utilidad el fenotipo, alguna indicación o sería suficiente con los genotipos. No, we don't, in, in, in our country, we don't use the phenotype anymore. We, we use the genotype and, and um, in the plasma and um, you know the, the 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 resistance testing in proviral DNA is really uh, complex and we should not rely on the results. Um, but we only use genotyping because the phenotyping is so expensive. I'm not. I don't know whether this is possible in your country because phenotype um, takes four weeks for the results, and it's much more expensive than genotyping. Sí, era posible, financiado por algunos laboratorios, no por el sector público. Okay. Eh, nos hablaba que eh, generalmente los pacientes que son muy experimentados a fármacos toman muchas tabletas al día y pues ellos desean una simplificación de tratamiento. Sin embargo, esto no siempre es posible. Eh, me gustaría que nos aclarara o, o, eh, acerca de cuando un paciente tiene resistencia intermedia a Darunavir y toma Darunavir eh, dos veces al día, eh, ¿por qué no es posible eh, desescalarlo o simplificarlo a Darunavir Covicista? Porque en algunas ocasiones eh, hacen esto los médicos buscando que el paciente tome menos tabletas pero si tiene una resistencia intermedia a dar una vir, pues no estaríamos asegurando su actividad. Yes, that's true. And this is really a, a, a very difficult question. And um, it depends, I think, on the resistance patterns in this patient. Arunavir dosage from BID to QD. And I think if you have at least three to four mutations, um, then I would prefer double dosing. However, if you combine Darunavir with uh, another drug with, high, with a high resistance barrier, um, in my experience, this will work. So we had so many patients on Simtuza, Darunavir, Cobisistat, and FTAF, plus dolotigravir, and this is a two pills regimen and that you can use in more than 90% of this with multidrug resistance. And so I, I would, yes, I would agree with uh, switching from BID to QD, but only if you have another drug with, with a high resistance barrier. Okay. Dr. Hoffman, and uh, thank you again for your talk. And we wish we wish you feel better very soon. And thanks. Okay. So thank you very much. And Yes. Have a nice day. Bye bye.